I begin my Fire Emblem Engage Iron Man by picking maddening classic difficulty because I'm not a coward. As this is an Iron Man challenge, I cannot reload or reset saves and I am not allowed to use the Draconic Time Crystal to rewind turns or undo mistakes. If I get a game over, I must start the run from the very beginning. For my character customization, I pick a male Alir and name him Marth to maximize the confusion and dialogue that I will not be reading. Cutscenes will thus be randomly spliced in from an entirely different playthrough. The game opens with a fake flash forward cutscene popping popularized by the success of Fire Emblem Awakening. We see four quirky color-coded lords hold off corrupted soldiers so our protagonist Alir can hurry to fight the boss in a prophetic metaphor for how they will all inevitably die when I intentionally kill them all for minimal gain. The prologue of Fire Emblem Engage is more or less scripted. The typical sequence of events has you attacking Sombron and him attacking back, charging your engage meter to foe. On the next turn, Alir and Marth will automatically perform a Fire Emblem Engage and merge in a pre-rendered Cutscene. You're then supposed to kill Sombron with your engage skill, and in fact, all of the other menu options are intentionally disabled so you don't die to the tutorial boss. But that won't stop me. As it turns out, you can just open the menu and end your turn without attacking, allowing you to immediately get yourself killed and trigger a game over. The end. Having had my fun, I reload the map and then defeat the boss with a lodestar rush. In chapter 1 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Alir awakes from a 1000 year slumber to find themselves flanked by a pair of deranged dragons and cultists with rhyming names who are the most recent cohort of a long line of intergenerational divine dragon simpery. It is discovered that Alir has amnesia, which is narratively convenient as it means she has no prior knowledge of the world and because it adds mystique and intrigue. Vander, a higher ranking cultist of the Lithos chapter of the overground divine dragon sect, decides to take Alir to the divine dragon monarch to jumpstart her memory. But the crew is intercepted by the corrupted, which are the designated enemy type in this game that is morally correct to kill. Alir tries to run because she is a coward but Clan and Fram were accidentally set to auto battle so they suicidally charge in and are surrounded. The map begins and Clan and Fram are unarmed green units that run away to the north. I've tried but it seems impossible for Clan and Fram to die in this map, but Alir can. All you need to do is move him forward away from the brush. But otherwise, after fighting for a few turns, a cutscene plays and Alir summons Marth to fight a single corrupted in a well choreographed and animated cutscene that tells us that Alir is a weak lord with little combat power. Alir is then moved farther up the map and can engage with Mark to easily dispatch the remaining corrupted. The map closes as even more monsters flood in before they are all annihilated by a gigantic laser fired by a dragon. In chapter 2 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, the dragon that rescued us is revealed to be Lumera, who is Alir's mother and who has ruled Elios with an iron fist for over a thousand years as an immortal dragon emperor. Fun fact, if you explore the previous map after beating it, you can get your hands on these nuts. Lumera feeds us a propaganda laden revisionist history of how the evil fell dragon Sabron was defeated by the virtuous Fire Emblem Four Houses of Elios which are all color coded for our convenience. She then exposes the story of the 12 emblem rings which can grant immense power when brought together. But the real question is how do you put on 12 rings if you only have 10 fingers? Don't answer that. Since Queen Lumera hails from a time where beating your children was an acceptable practice, she decides to attack Alir who has until 15 minutes ago been an inanimate comatose vegetable. The map begins and it's a tutorial map where characters unfortunately cannot die permanently. After defeating the first wave, Lumera then teleports to the top of the map and equips Emblem Sigurd for a setup which is specifically made to jump scare you by hitting Vander for 30 damage with the Horse Slayer. But I anticipate this and lure her out with my other units, and I do chip damage with Clan and Vander before using Lodestar Rush to take her down. As a reward for winning, Lumera gives Alir the Liberation, which is probably one of the weakest personal weapons in Fire Emblem history, and also an ornately designed ring with a conspicuous blue and red gemstone, which is purely ornamental and obviously has no significance at all. In chapter 3 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Alir has a dream where she does a funny meme face and has a red color scheme because this scene is a red herring. She wakes up to find that Lethal's castle is being invaded by green units, the true villain of all Fire Emblem games. We fight to reach the ring chamber and are joined by Alfred, Etie, and Bencheron, who are all mediocre units at best who likely cannot keep up at maddening difficulty because of the scarcity of XP. This is the first real map of the game and is very tightly designed with Etie having just enough damage to one shot flyers and many kills coming together very cleanly. I push to the top of the map and reach the Armor Knight boss of Bime and I try to set up a kill for Alir, but unfortunately Vander gets two 5% criticals in a row, killing her immediately and stealing my XP. We reach the ring chamber and find the Maxman, who is a small child in a comically large robe, who teleports behind Alir and whispers nothing personnel kid before using the industry standard ominous bad guy dark magic. Lumera uses dual guard to protect Alir, but since this isn't Fire Emblem Fates, she just gets hit instead of blocking the blow. Mortally wounded, Lumera fires a laser beam out 
out of her rings to ward off the invading Gredlin Trespasser, who in her retreat drops the Draconic Time Crystal, which has no gameplay function because I plan to beat this game without using it as a crutch. I theorized that the mysterious tiny intruder used the Draconic Time Crystal to repeatedly reroll the RNG in the previous scene to rook a critical hit, which explains how Lumera got one shot. Queen Lumera then has one of the longest death cutscenes known to man, where she spends 5 minutes desperately trying to dump as much exposition and setup as possible before she croaks, and then she dies. In Chapter 4 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Alfred convinces us to go to Fyrne to help protect his weak, peace-loving nation from the corrupted. Here we recruit Louis, who is quite good as an Armonite, Chloe, who is one of the only natural fires that you get, and Saline, who was more than 80% dressed by volume. The chapter begins, I decided I want to train Fram, and so to maximize SP gain, I equip Emblem Sigurd to her, and then I begin the process of training her to level 20 on Chapter 4. I bunched everyone up onto the bottom half of the map, and cleared most of the enemies before turning my attention to the boss, and I start spamming Chain Guard with Fram to grind XP. The way Chain Guard works for Chia Adept classes is that they can block a hit for an adjacent ally at the cost of 20% of their HP, gaining a small amount of XP as a reward. This only works if you're at full HP, so you can only block one hit before you need to heal. But since I have Fram on a fort, she gets passive healing and so can Chain Guard every turn and gain XP every turn. The AI does not factor in Chain Guards when considering their targeting, meaning that you can lure enemies into attacking specific units by lowering their HP to a point where they will normally die. I surround the boss and I coax him into attacking a pre-weakened Alfred, and I start spamming Chain Guard with Fram on the fort. In manning difficulty, Chain Guards will normally grant you a maximum of 5 XP as long as the unit you're defending is of a similar or higher level. So once Fram starts exceeding Alfred's level, the XP gain slows down, and while I have previously done similar grinds at a rate of 1 XP per turn, I would prefer to avoid it if possible. I then have a brilliant idea. Vander has a very high internal level due to being an early pre-promote, so I weakened him so the boss targets him and I have Fram chain guard Vander instead. She manages to gain the maximum 5 XP bonus per chain guard until level 15 or so before it starts decreasing. By level 19, she only gains 1 XP per turn, but that's still enough to reach level 20. And so, by using the Vander chain guard method, I'm able to level up Fram at maximum speed. In a blazingly fast process that only takes 2 hours and 485 turns, Fram reaches her level cap as a level 20 martial monk and still isn't that good. In chapter 5 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, the flamboyant illusion general Neluce has taken Queen Eva Firone hostage, and Zephia, a villain who looks even more ridiculous, and thus who is of higher military rank, commands him to take her emblem rings. The chapter begins and is normally a fairly tightly designed map when you have an army that is more or less unchanged from the joining stats. However, this balance is completely thrown off by the presence of Fram, who is 19 levels higher than she should be. I start by immediately having her delete an enemy with her fists, and then use Warp Rock to one-shot the treasure stealing thief. Fram's stats are mediocre for the mid-game, but very high for this early game chapter, and she clears the entire left side of the map by herself. I grab the treasure and form up to take on the boss through the front entrance. I consider that I haven't killed anyone off yet, and I figure that I should fix that. Since Alfred is already secretly dying of a terminal illness, I decide to make it official. I throw him into overlapping enemy ranges and watch as he is unceremoniously killed by two sword fighters. Alfred's valiant, yet entirely unnecessary sacrifice moves the hearts of the remaining enemies and they move towards me to attack. I defeat the minions and take on the boss's first health bar with a flurry of attacks from Vander, Alir, and Louis, and a second by having Fram punch him four times before feeding the kill to Alir. Neluce somehow managed to retreat, but is caught in a cutscene by Zephia, who demonstrates how evil she is by killing him herself. What kind of sick, deranged lunatic can bring themselves to kill their own soldiers? In Chapter 6 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Alfred's mutilated body, held together by the high monetary cost of pre-rendered cutscenes, guides us to a shrine where Makaya's emblem ring is kept. On the way, we bump into Yunaka, who is a fallen VTuber that has been cast down from her agency to live out the rest of her hellish existence in real life. Yunaka's character lore is that she is secretly a criminal with a dark past who covers it up with a facade of cheerful normalcy and unique speech patterns incomprehensible to the average person. In other words, she is a typical modern streamer. Can we get a zappy and then chat everyone? This is a fog of war map, but fortunately I have already played it before so I generally know what to expect. Regardless, I accidentally put a leer in range of three enemies that can possibly kill him, but fortunately I bail myself out with a level 20 fram warp Ragnarok cancel. I keep moving to the left and I accidentally trigger the boss a bit earlier than I expected, and because I have a poor sense of self-preservation, I decide to commit to fighting him instead of retreating. Unfortunately, half my team is liable to being one-shot by the boss's hand axe, and Alir and Yunaka are halfway across the map, so this gets tricky. Fram takes down the boss's first health bar with a momentum-boosted Seraphim, then I have Butron repeatedly chain attack the bandit boss in combination with my other units until I get the kill with Clan, completing the map with no casualties, much to my own disappointment. In Chapter 7 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Alfred's remarkably mobile corpse guides us across the Fyrone's border towards the next end 
Golden Ring. And we are intercepted by Alcris, a prince of Brodio, who perpetually exists in a quantum superposition of complete loser and absolute Chad. As well as his retainer, Citrine, who is an aristocrat who exclusively uses her vast wealth to show off and support conversations, but refuses to put a single cent of it towards saving the world. And Lapis, who hunts bears. We move and find that Brodio is under attack by Hortensia, a theoretically 14-year-old clown princess of Illusia who wields a dark emblem, which is just like a normal emblem except that it is red. We start the map and I immediately have Alfred's one shot a couple of fires, which I have come to realize are extremely prevalent in this game. I push through the bridge as enemies flank us from the sides and come up to the final area where Hortensia lies in wait. I decide to lure the boss by sacrificing Boucheron, but Hortensia denies me this by using the all for one and failing to kill him. Damn, it seems like I can't even throw if I want to. Now that the boss has moved into my attack range, I just go for the kill. I first defeat Rosile to get a steel act and then take down Hortensia's first health bar with a flurry of chain attacks and then finish her off with Fram. I then decide to take a detour to do some paralogues in this madly engaged Iron Man and I start with Tiki's paralogue which can grant any character the ability to turn into a dragon, something that your divine dragon main character cannot do. This map features a large number of ice weapons that have high stats, deal penetrating damage and can also freeze your units. Fortunately, they are vulnerable to bows so I forge and engrave some steel bows to aid in defeating them. The enemies on this map are normally not very aggressive but there are large reinforcement waves from the south so to maximize my safety I decide to spawn camp them. With my forged steel bows, I am able to one-shot the wyverns and clear the first wave very cleanly without taking much damage. But I realize that clearing the waves cleanly is not efficient. Instead, it's more ideal to take as much damage as possible to maximize the XP that Saline gets from healing with great sacrifice, since it grants XP for every character healed. So instead of using my strong forged bows that I made specifically for this map, I instead use weaker weapons so I can take more damage. I grind through all the reinforcements and gain a ton of XP in doing so, both from kills and healing. With the reinforcements exhausted, I then carefully clear the remaining enemies. I activate the switches and warp to the lake and back to get the silver card. The door to Tiki's chamber is unlocked and she immediately grants one of her ice wyverns a revival stone and becomes aggressive. I try to one shot this beefed up wyvern but I am exactly one damage off since apparently this wyvern has just a bit more defense than the others just to fuck with you. I take out the first health bar with the warp back and rock plus a poison gamut from Alcris to inflict the poison status effect which grants me the exact one more damage I need to one shot the second health bar with Etienne. But then this leads to the question of Tiki. Fortunately, she can only attack from one range, so I block her off with a Micaiah boosted AoE obstruct. I then converge onto her and attack in a way that maximizes damage from my team to maximize healing XP for great sacrifice. But in doing so, I leave myself vulnerable to attack. And since Etie has already served her purpose on this map, I offer her up as bait. But unfortunately, Etie kills Tiki on the counter attack and survives. This is the second time in a row I've failed to kill off a character. There will not be a third. Next up in this maddening engaged Iron Man is the Anna Paralogue where we can recruit this game's version of Anna, which are a recurring set of red-haired merchant sisters that have appeared in many Fire Emblem games, sometimes as shop NPCs but more recently as playable characters. Each of the Annas are identical and I theorize that this is because Annas reproduce asexually in a process similar to the budding of yeast. Once an Anna has accumulated enough money, an outgrowth forms and splits off from the main body forming a new Anna. Since this version of Anna is a small child, we can conclude that she has recently split off and has a low net worth. We begin the map to see this small merchant gremlin poking around a bandit's hideout looking for wealth to appropriate. But the alarm is sounded and she decides to hide inside of a chest, which is a metaphor for how human lives are a commodity. Since I waited before doing this chapter, my units are a much higher level than they need to be, so for the most part, this map is a cakewalk. I rush down the center to open the chest and Anna pops out, immediately making a beeline to Alir so we can recruit her more easily. I defeat the boss to complete the map and Anna decides to join our army so she can monetarily benefit from war profiteering. After that, in this maddening engaged Iron Man is the John Paralogue, where we can recruit John, the trainee unit of this game who has a personal skill that increases growths. John can be quite good in a variety of roles as long as you invest the resources into training him correctly, but unfortunately, he is British. The map begins and it is a route objective where we can't defend a bunch of villagers for additional rewards. Fortunately, because this map has a recommended level of 4, it is trivial. I grab the energy drop from the lower right village and clear all of the enemies with ease. After the chapter ends, John asks to join us and we successfully radicalize yet another small child into joining our extra legal religious paramilitary organization. In chapter 8 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, we enter Brodia Castle where Diamond has him patiently waiting for 4 hours facing the gate so he can dramatically turn around to greet us. We also meet King Morian who is a fun and likable dude who has killed an unspecified number of innocent illusion citizens in his brutal wars of conquest. But this moment of mirth is interrupted as Ivy, the first princess of Illusia, who is wearing a screen door on her face 
Reyes shows up in the Tax Castle. This is the defend map with a kill boss objective, and we are joined by Diamant and Amber, who are okay units if you want to use them, but quickly get outcompeted by characters joining in upcoming maps. I begin by placing Alcris onto the Ballista, which allows him to one-shot enemy fires within the herds, and I move aggressively to take out enemies before they can stack up and overwhelm me. I use a Warp Ragnarok to clear a mage on the right side so Louie can safely line up an override to get a double kill. I then back off to allow the stronger named units to approach. I bait them in and I take out Kagetsu with a Lodestar Rush from Saline and take down Zelkov with Fram. The boss Ivy then starts moving and I have Amber sacrifice his life to make her move into a suitable position and he successfully dies to grant me next to no benefit as Ivy probably would have moved to the same spot regardless. I have Saline and Diamond attack Ivy to take out her first health bar and I send Fram forward to take out another enemy that has a stat booster but by doing this I made my boss kill more unreliable. I attack Ivy with Citrine and then try to finish her job with Alcrest in the hopes that two chain attacks hit and they do. All skill, no luck required. After driving off Ivy, we hear that King Hyacinth of Illusia has challenged King Morian to 1v1 me bro and the Brodian King rapidly drops as many death flags as he can before he leaves to get himself killed. In chapter 9 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, King Morian declares that if you use emblem rings you didn't beat the game and charges into battle unassisted. He gets into a 1 on 1 against King Hyacinth and quickly gets the upper hand, but Hyacinth takes out an emblem ring and puts it on, causing Morian to spasm as he sits shocked and motionless, indignant that the Illusion King has violated the honor of the fight that he imagined in his own head. He declares a Hyacinth that cheated not only the game, but himself. He took a shortcut and gained nothing and will experience a hollow victory. Hyacinth shoots him in the heart and then kidnaps him so his blood can be drained to revive the fell dragon. Alir and Diamant try to rescue Morian but they're too late because Hyacinth has told Ivy that as a child you are replaceable and sends her in as a sacrificial pawn to delay us. As for why we didn't use the draconic time crystal to save the king, it's because Alir burnt all of the charges as a magical DVR to replay the fight scene where Hyacinth did some sick martial arts moves. The map begins and this is a defeat boss map with some reinforcements. We can recruit Jade who is a mediocre armor knight that is not as good as Louie. I overpower many of the enemies with Saline who has 11 sword and is now very strong. And to safely engage the boss, I lure Ivy with Boucheron and he dies. I peel away Ivy's retinue and take out her first health bar with a Mercurius Lodestar Rush from Saline and her second bar by hitting her with Fram and Alir. We realize that Ivy was sent on a suicide mission and because we know that she is a recruitable character for all the promotional material, we let her live. In chapter 10 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, we chase the illusions to Destinia Cathedral to try to rescue King Morian, but he is already dead and has been turned into a corrupted. Morth prudently suggests that we retreat, but Alcris and Diamonds are blinded by rage and convince Alir to stand and fight. This is a two-stage map with three bosses and is one of the first difficulty spikes of the game. The first room pits you against Hortensia and her retainers who flank you from both sides. I have Louie override to chip and dismantle Rosado's group and take care of Goldberry shortly after. I form up and take down Hortensia as quickly as possible so I can get her free step before she uses it up. Next up is a door that we open to trigger the second phase of the map, but as it turns out there is a cheese dredge you can pull off here. By using a rewarp staff, I move Fram past the door to trigger enemy aggression and soon after warp her away. The enemies move down towards me but their AI breaks as they cannot open the door. So I get Corrupt and Morgan stuck and have Alchrist give his father peace by shooting him 20 times with a longbow. Upon killing Morian, Hyacinth becomes aggressive and fires off an astral Storm with his killer bow, instantly annihilating Chloe since I was not paying attention to his range. Because of a misplaced sense of honor and hubris, I then decide to destroy the door to fight Hyacinth fairly instead of cheesing him, but this just ends up getting me into a sticky situation as I don't have enough damage to kill him. I'm only able to take out one health bar in my first round, and Hyacinth punishes this failure by immediately killing Vander in retaliation with the Manikati. I then finish off his last health bar and get the kill with Alcrest. After we defeat Hyacinth, he speaks to a resurrected Sombron, but is immediately devoured by his evil snake dragon patron in a story beat that is almost exactly like that of King Garen's from the Revelation route of Fire Emblem Fates. No. In chapter 11 of this Maddie Engage Iron Man, it is revealed that the midget who killed Lumera is Vale, the fell dragon's daughter that has been previously introduced as a mysterious stranger in earlier chapters via cutscenes that have all conspicuously displayed images of her bare feet. And in fact, the specific reason we recognize her is yet another CG of her feet. Intelligence Systems clearly has 
priorities. We are also introduced to the four hounds who we'll be fighting for our next 14 chapters. Aliar tells everyone to fire emblem, engage. However, Veo, whose footsteps are silent because she does not wear shoes, manages to sneak up on us and steals the draconic time crystal and uses it in a cutscene to take all of her emblems. Sarbron corrupts the emblems of fellow dragon energy and turns them all into evil dark emblems, though paradoxically, Murdoch's evil version has no changes to his personality. We are forced to retreat and begin the map, which is an escape chapter where we are robbed of all of our emblem rings, while the enemies use their powers against us. Even if we defeat the corrupted that have them, the rings are simply moved to a new enemy. We also don't have the time crystal, but fortunately that is not a handicap for me. As I progress downwards towards the escape point, I am hit by AoE freeze stabs for an enemy emblem of Kaya user, which slows me down significantly, and I am forced to leave Etty behind as bait, and she dies. Once I'm halfway towards escaping, a cutscene activates and the four hounds spawn in as bosses to hunt us down, and simultaneously Ivy, Zelkov, and Kagetsu show up to reinforce us with the Lucina and Lin emblems, and Zelkov manages to pickpocket Veil to reclaim the Draconic Time Crystal that has no gameplay function. I feel confident in my abilities and I decide to stand and fight the four hounds for extra XP, but I quickly realize that's not a good idea as Zephyr in particular is ridiculously strong. She has three health bars and can one round anyone on my team with her Leaven Sword. Because of this tactical overextension, I'm easily within attack range of the four hounds, and as I try to retreat, Jade is killed by Zephyr. To avoid further losses, I try to warp a to the escape point, but there are enemy emblem users blocking the way. I have Saline warp down Alcris first, who uses Raging Storm to leapfrog and refresh his turn to defeat a corrupted blocking the escape point, and I then do a trade chain to trade over my warp staff to Fram, so she can warp Alir five tiles down, allowing him to run to the escape point and finish our chapter with no further casualties. I then take a pit stop in this maddening engaged Iron Man to do the incredibly important Lucina Paralogue, which will allow me to obtain the powerful Dual Assist Plus skill, which can do a ton of free damage. This map is based on the Arena for Roll map for Fire Emblem Awakening, and is mostly just a flat plane with a bunch of enemies. The context of this map is that it is a friendly spar between allies where Lucina is nonetheless willing to murder you and all of your friends. I move forward quickly, knocking away the grunt enemies with surprising ease. I also take the time to train Anno, since I have not had the opportunity to do so in previous maps. I also manage to get Saline to promote a level 5, giving her Ignis, improving her already impressive damage output. Finally, I scare off against Lucina, who I realize I actually cannot cleanly kill in one turn. I take out the first health bar with a TT transform Anna and Louie, and then have Alcris summon doubles with Lin in the hopes that I survive. Fortunately, the enemies are successfully baited into attacking the decoys, so I take out the entire second health Health bar where the houses unite from Louis and finish Lucina off with an Astro Storm. This completes the map and allows us to get Lucina's bond level to its maximum value, so I can do long range chain attack shenanigans in upcoming chapters. Midway through my maddening engage Iron Man, Wave 2 of the expansion pass DLC launched with new emblems alongside a ton of free stuff, which I assume, canonically speaking, is Citrine finally contributing to the war effort. I decide to start with Hector's Paralogue since it seems like the easiest. This map is based on Chapter 30 of FE7 Hector Mode and it features a riveting game mechanics such as poison events, which are almost entirely ignorable because poison is a very weak status effect. I push towards the left and pick up reinforcements spawning from the starting area, getting a ton of experience in the process. Most of the treasure is garbage, but I make sure to pick off an enemy thief that loses a Draco shield from a chest up north. I clean up the map and then approach Emblem Hector, who begins the fight by wasting his turn with Storm's Eye, which nullifies break, prevents enemies from doubling him, and allows Hector to have guaranteed doubles for one turn. But this is nothing because players are likely intelligent enough to not attack into the skill. Hector moves in a bit further, and because of his high defense, killing him immediately is not very practical. So I open by hitting him with a freeze staff, and then kill him by attacking from outside his range with Thoron Tomes. Upon completing the map, we are awarded with the Hector Bracelet, which is honestly kind of bad. In the Camilla paralogue of this maddening engaged Iron Man, I suffer from a very low frame rate because, just like my strategies in this playthrough, this chapter's graphics are unoptimized. This map is based on Chapter 23 from Fire Emblem Fates Birthright, where Camilla fights you in the sewers of Nor. To reflect that map's gimmick, this one has Camilla use dragon veins to shoot fireballs that destroy and open up terrain so the infinite Gryffindor reinforcements can flank and hunt you down. I decide to start training John, and to this end, I reclass my level 1 into an Arbor Knight and give him a forged killer axe and a Tiki emblem. I find my way along the lower corridor and move towards the upper right, using Alcris to one-shot many of the Gryffindor reinforcements. John struggles 
to get XP because the opportunities to feed kills to a low level unit are limited, especially since the map has scaling difficulty and all of the enemies are promoted. Reinforcers continue to pressure me, so I decided to try to end the map early by luring Camilla with a 20 range Asher Storm from Alcrest. Camilla is successfully lured and becomes aggressive, attacking me with a pack of fires, and I move to take her down immediately. But I am too hasty and I misclick, causing Zelkov to attack a wyvern who immediately counterattacks with a spear and kills him. After this complete unnecessary and accidental death, I also find that Camilla has a ton of resistance, and my original plan of blasting her with Thoron would do barely any damage. I have already committed half my forces, so if I don't manage to kill her this turn, there will likely be a massacre. So, I am forced to go all in. I chip Camilla with a fallen star and land a coin flip Thoron to take out her first bar, and for her second health bar, I attack with Alchrist and pray. On his first hit, he activates Luna, and on his second hit, he activates Luna again, killing Camilla from full HP and saving my entire team from being slaughtered. In the Soren paralogue of this Manning engaged Iron Man, I realized that Zelkov's death in the previous chapter has seemingly had unintentional benefits because it lowered my armory's average level and thus reduced the difficulty of this chapter. In the last map, all of my enemies were promoted, but somehow, in this one, these enemies are all unpromoted level 19. Funny how that works. Soren's paralogue is based on chapter 3-8 of Radiant Dawn and features large reinforcement waves, volcanic explosions, and also expanding smoke terrain that reduces defense and restricts movement. The enemies on this map are a lot weaker than the previous map, so I am able to train John to a much greater extent. He's able to defeat many weak martial monks that do very little physical damage, and he gets to a decently high level. This map has a very large but technically finite number of reinforcements, so I decide to exhaust them until they stop completely, because Soren can be very dangerous with his bolting tome. Any hit from an enemy or a hit from a volcanic explosion could easily result in Soren killing one of my units with bolting, so I don't want to approach him if I don't have to. After grinding through all of the enemies, I lure Soren by hitting him with a 20 range Astro Storm. Soren moves forward and hits me with a couple of both things, but I manage to avoid casualties. I then pounce to take Soren out. Nubi one shots his first health bar with a Silver Great Lance and knocks him into the smoke, giving him minus 5 defense. Yunaka follows up to do more damage, and I finish off his second bar with an Astro Storm. Finally, I have Fram quadruple him to finish him off to complete the map. This grants us the Soren bracelet, which is perhaps one of the best DLC emblems. For his utility in XP and SP grinding, and his use in an extremely overpowered endgame build. In Chapter 12 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, we enter Sohm and meet Fogato, who is the captain of the Sentinels, Pedreo, who is a priest, and Bune, who is an all-consuming eldritch horror. This map is a breather chapter, likely intended to soften the blow of losing your emblem rings in Chapter 11, though at the same time it also has a heavily restricted number of deployment slots, which is a little irksome. This map is also a route objective with reinforcements, has map gimmicks that restrict movement, and villagers with dumb AI that need rescuing. The map is fairly easy to begin with, but with all my new toys, it's a cakewalk. I use Soren on sailing to abuse bolting and snipe faraway enemies, and continue training John, who has become stronger than most standard enemies at this point. I clear the map and manage to rescue all the villagers and get the honestly fairly useless rewards. After the chapter is completed, we enter Soul Palace and find out that Fogato is actually a prince who personally goes on patrols, and we are supposed to think that this is surprising, as if we didn't already know who he was from all the brochure material, and as if royals who patrol the frontiers isn't something we've already seen multiple times. In Chapter 13 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, we meet Queen Sephoria of Soam, who tells us that because they have no idea what's going on in the plot, they have in fact forgotten where their emblem ring is, before remembering that Princess Tamara has it but is camping out in the countryside. We go to see her, but we are suddenly ambushed by the Meat Song, which deals critical psychic damage directly to me in real life, marking the first time I've ever reflexively skipped a fire and low cutscene for the sake of self-preservation. This is a Fog of War map that once again has a small number of deployment slots, mainly to accommodate for three new units. Tamara, who is Sol's lead researcher in unethical sound-based human torture, Marin, whose prosthetic tail makes her very good at chess, and Panette, who has thoughts about society. I deploy my limited number of units and immediately grab Angelic Grove from the village to the right before moving south. I use Camilla's Dragon Vein ability on a Leer to create ice terrain to boost Louis's movement so he can intercept the enemy barbarian from destroying a village to secure a rescue staff. As I progress, Wyvern's flanking me from above while two industry standard flamboyant bandit boss brothers attack me from the right. I get many super chats of viewers trying to convince me to kill Tamara and I oblige. I send Tamara out with great ether and she is killed after being quadrupled by a brave axe. I repeatedly try to feed John boss kills but he keeps missing so I end up not having enough damage for a clean kill. So my solution is to have Louis smash one of the bosses into a corner and then move up to body block him. Finally on the third try John has a 100% hit rate 
right and thus cannot miss, so he gets the boss kill to close the map. In the closing cutscene, we found out that Solm's aloofness has been a ruse, and also that Hortensia has invaded Solm Palace, because for some reason, in this game, castles are not structures built to resist assault, but are in fact points of extreme vulnerability. In Chapter 14 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Hortensia has invaded the castle alone and is holding Queen Sephora hostage, but we manage to talk her down. However, suddenly, Zephia shows up and whoops out mind control magic, another classic fire emblem fetish. I mean, um, excuse me plot device, and we need to fight her anyway. This is to defeat boss man with 4 bosses, and finally our unit deployment limit has gone back up to a healthy 12 slots. I decided to reclass Panette into a warrior and give her John's Forge Killer Axe because she has very high strength, which synergizes well with high crit rates. I send John over to the left, alone, where he cannot be hurt by any of the lance enemies, and he picks them off one by one. Unfortunately, because he only has 4 movements, most of the enemies literally run right past him and he cannot catch up. Meanwhile, on the right side, I plow through the enemy enemies with Panette, who gets many one-shot criticals on these increasingly tanky enemies. I get the boots and radiant bow from the right side by having Panette kill a thief, and the treasure on the left side by having Alchris snipe him with an Astro Store. I then prepare to enter the central chamber where all of the bosses are, and I use Bolting to lure Mobier in. As I do this, reinforcement fire is spawned from the south, and feeling confident in my position, I don't really pay attention to enemy ranges all that much, and Citrine is immediately doubled and killed by a flyer. I take out Mobier with Louis, and Lyra and Zephia next. Panette takes out a fire, but then then is immediately evaporated by a 3% crit, which is so fucking bullshit, what the fuck? I clean up the remaining fires and take out Zephyr with an Alchris Luna and I defeat Marty with a bunch of magical attacks. Hortensia then moves in and she's honestly kinda weak so I just repeatedly attack her and feed the kills to Alir, completing the map and granting us the Byleth Emblem, which gives us a 4 person dance. As the chapter closes, we leave to go find the Corrin Emblem, which much like Corrin herself has been sequestered, alone in a remote, isolated castle. In chapter 15 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, we get Sido who is this game's dancer. This map has an escape objective and it begins with Sido under attack by two corrupted who will kill him extremely quickly and cause the game over if we don't do something immediately. I use a rescue staff to get him out of immediate danger while I clear the initial room of enemies. I recruit Sido by talking to him and the escape objective changes to a much farther location. This map is full of enemies that activate only once the room has been opened and so I go room by room cleaning them all individually. Around halfway through the map, four extremely powerful corrupted warriors with very high stats spawn behind you to try to get you to run away from them and hurry up, but I'm feeling powerful today so I decided to fight them for XP, and I do this by having fun with bolting while I still can, before enemy resistance gets high enough that its minuscule 2 might makes it useless. To boost bolting's power, I surround Saline with 4 support partners to get a massive 40 extra hit to make this long range siege tone very accurate. I bolting once and then dance and then bolting again to kill a warrior. On the second turns, I use bolting again, then dance, then bolting again, then use a Byleth Goddess Dance to refresh the dancer and bolting again and then dance again and then bolting for a fourth time to kill two more warriors. I block off the lasso with an obstruct staff and then finish him off next turn, completely slaughtering the anti stalling mechanic of this map with sheer brute force. I clear the remaining rooms at an ironically brisk pace, mainly prioritizing giving XP to John, but has become nearly as good as Louis at this point. As the chapter concludes, we bump into Vale again, and she apparently has no recollection of any of her misdeeds. Alir and company are skeptical and yell at her, but are apparently not skeptical enough to take her prisoner and they just let her run away. In chapter 16 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Hortensia's retainers, Gold Mary and Rosado, steal the Eroka emblem ring and run away to join us. This map has a terrain gimmick where several predetermined areas will periodically be flooded with water and restrict movement. If you're not careful, your army can easily be split up, but the same thing can happen to the enemy. There's a village in the upper left, but all it has is a recover staff, so going to get it is not really worth it. So instead, I decided to go to the bottom of the map to reach the bosses faster. I clear the southern island and use it as a staging ground to fight the rest of the enemies and many of them get stuck because of the rising water levels. I defeat the flanking enemy fires to the right with my own flying units and I use Emblem of Korin's Fire Dragon Vein to create difficult terrain to the north to delay those enemies and pick them off slowly. I then use Astro Storm to lure the bosses into attacking me and Malfear comes out alone, allowing me to dispatch him quite easily. I take out his first health bar with Louie and then defeat him with Saley. Marty then moves in and I bolt you away her first health bar from long range before getting the kill with John, completing the map and finally getting us away from Solm. 
As the chapter closes, Marnie and Malvia retreat, while Vale reveals that she is searching for an unknown lost sibling, who as indicated by aggressive foreshadowing is obviously Alir. In chapter 17 of this maddening engaged Ironman, the four hounds destroy a Fiorini's port under the orders of Vale, who in fact has two completely separate personalities, meaning that the good version is absolved of any and all wrongdoing. As this fact is exhaustingly and repeatedly elaborated upon, Vale is hit with mind control magic and becomes Evale. The map begins and it is a grand showdown between all 12 emblem rings. It's evenly matched with 6 emblem rings on their side and 6 emblem rings and 5 DLC emblem bracelets on ours. Clearly an even and fair fight. In preparation for this challenge, I sell all of my stuff to donate 90,000 gold to Firenay to obtain the S rank Great Lance Venomous, which I cannot use effectively because Louis doesn't have enough land strength to use it as a Great Knight. I give it to Halberd Rosado instead, but he's too fragile to ever survive if he attacks with it. The objective of this map is to defeat all 6 bosses, which include the 4 Hounds, Vale, and a Corrupted High Sith. Gris attacks first from the north with Warp Ragnarok and he strikes Louis for 40 damage. I nail him with a Silent Staff, making him unable to counterattack with his tome, and immediately pile onto him and destroy him. Next, I litter Marty and Malvir with Astro Storm and brace for impact. I slow them down with a Fire Dragon Bane and repeatedly land multiple Dreadful Order Freezes to stop them from moving while I pick apart their retinue. As they are frozen in place, they are perfectly lined up for a delayed Great Aether from John that takes out Malvir's first health bar and wounds Marnie. Marnie is incredibly tanky with Emblem Roy's holdouts, but I am able to attack repeatedly with dual assists and magic and they both go down. I recharge my emblems to face the last three bosses and Zephia, armed with Sigur, zooms in first, but has a bit too much backup to take down immediately, so I freeze her in place of Dreadful Aura. In particular, there is a tough corrupted worm that can one-shot many of my units with penetrating damage, but I manage to take it down with a lucky critical from Fram. I take out Zephia's first health bar with John and Goldberry, and I finish her off with a settling Thoron and Alchrist Astrostorm. Finally, Hyacinth and Vale move in with a ton of other enemies, and I exhaust most of my emblems just trying to fend them all off, so I'm forced to retreat, but I'm not able to fall back entirely, and some of my units are left in enemy range. I desperately try to use Obstruct to compensate, but I fail, and Vale one rounds John with Obscurite, costing me one of my best units. But all is not lost, as this move has placed Hyacinth and Vale in my attack range. But unfortunately, Vale has crazy offensive stats and can kill anyone I send against her. All of my emblems are exhausted, so if I don't kill her, then I am liable to lose nearly everyone, so I have to make some very risky plays. I decide to gamble on a 60% hit silence on Vale to nullify her counterattacks, and it succeeds. I then have Louie whack her for nearly her entire first health bar and then follow up with Gold Mary to empty it. I then dance for Louie and with a duel of sits he manages to one-shot Vale's second health bar and defeat her, avenging John's death. Now all that remains is Hyacinth, but I have exhausted most of my damage potential, and so again I must gamble or else I will take heavy losses. I attack first with Alcris and he gets a Luna Critical, instantly wiping out Hyacinth's entire first health bar in dramatic fashion. I then pile on with all my remaining units to get as many chain attacks as possible and finish off the Corrupted Illusion King to complete the map. After clutching victory from the jaws of defeat with only one unfortunate loss, we recover Leaf's Emblem Ring and in the cutscene, Evil transforms back into Good Veil and throws Sigurd's Emblem Ring to us, indicating that she is indeed redeemable and probably recruitable. Emblem Leaf and Sigurd show up to speak specifically to reaffirm once again for the 30th time that Vale, in fact, is innocent of any wrongdoing and that we should feel bad for her. I then do the Byleth Paralogue in this maddening engaged Iron Man, which is inspired by Chapter 11 of Fire Emblem Three Houses, where thieves steal crystals from the Holy Tomb. The conceit of this map is that you're supposed to defend crystals for a reward that is complete garbage and not worth getting. The enemies on this map are surprisingly powerful, but nearly all of them have a unique AI that heavily prioritizes destroying crystals over anything else, including attacking your units. This makes most most of the enemies are completely helpless and very easy to kill. In the meantime, several staff users near Byleth repeatedly warp enemies at us, including several mini-bosses with their rival stones. But these enemies also have the crystal hunting AI and ignore us entirely. Byleth starts moving and I try to intercept him, but since he also ignores me entirely, I struggle to catch up. Eventually, I manage to trap Byleth in the corner with an ice dragon vein and cut him off. I repeatedly freeze him with dreadful aura and set up the kill. I apply poison with Merin and peel off his first health bar with Saline, his second with Louie, and his third with Fran. For his fourth and final health bar, I finish him off with a quadruple hit from Saline, completing the map and granting us no bonus rewards because too many crystals were destroyed.
destroyed. But completing this chapter allows us to max out Violet's bond level, which means that we can inherit Divine Pulse Plus, a cheap skill that can reroll misses into hits, which will be extremely important for future shenanigans because this also works for status stabs. In Chapter 18 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Sombron gives Zephyr the Kaga Helmet, which is a magical device designed specifically to mind control young girls because of a... Uh, reasons. Zephia also confirms that Sombra may have another living child, and perhaps it could be the only named dragon that isn't Sombra, Zephia, Lumera, or Vale. But alas, there are simply too many possibilities. Meanwhile, Alir, who is the only non-Sombra, non-Zephia, non-Lumera, non-Vale dragon, gets on a boat to sail to Illusia, but on the way is caught in a shipping war between Left Boat X Center Boat Shippers and Center Boat X Red Boat Shippers, the sequence of the phrasing dictating which is the dominant naval vessel in their respective non relationship. Unfortunately, the English localization of this game is censored and removes all possibility of a left boat x right boat pairing because they are both illusion ships that were constructed at the same shipyard and the translators deemed it inappropriate for a western audience. Um, anyway, uh, we are surrounded and face attacks from all sides. I first move up to take on flyers with the archers and use the flame cannon and dragon veins to slow the enemies to the right. There is an enemy thief on this map who steals a speed wing and I manage to snipe him with an astro storm at bolting. I move Ivy to the right to recruit Linden, who was a loyal center boat X right boat shipper and a surprisingly decent unit, and then fight a Bime, who was a reused boss from Chapter 3 that has inexplicably showed up again, reclassed from an armor knight into a berserker. Fortunately, she's weak and I freeze her in place to kill all the remaining enemies for XP, and then finish her off with Sally. As the chapter ends, all of the emblems get together in a group huddle to talk about their powers so they can set up a future plot point. But more importantly, they discuss how to better advertise their respective games to new players. In Chapter 19 of this maddening engagement, Iron Man, we sail into Illusia, only to find that everyone is dead. Here, we can recruit Saphir, who is a filler axe unit, but you need to hurry or else she'll die on turn 1, so I use a rescue staff to save her. This map has us face a tremendous number of corrupted, but more importantly, low frame rates. There is a unique feature of this map that previous ones have not had, a one tile choke point. I move all my units from the disconnected upper section into the middle and then place Louis right at the one tile choke point entrance at the bottom. Louis has enough defense to take literally zero damage from most of the enemies, so they stop and get stuck, unable to attack him, and this gives me a ton of leeway and free time to use degenerate grinding strategies. I do two such strategies, the first of which is using Emblem Sorin's Reflect Staff to rapidly power level Clan, who I have reclassed into an Axe Fighter. Reflect grants XP based on the number of targets in a similar way to Makaya's Great Sacrifice, but Reflect has no preconditions for its function, meaning that you can easily spam it every turn with no other setup. By using this, I easily get Clan's level 20, which is his level cap as an unpromoted unit. However, the grind doesn't stop there. While his XP gain is now restricted, his SP gain is not. So I continue using Reflect repeatedly to grant Clan more and more SP in a way that is much more efficient than leveling him normally. If Clan were to be a higher level, Reflect will grant less XP and thus less SP as he levels. But by grinding him when he is level capped, his internal level is artificially restricted and he can continue to have high SP gains for being a lower level. The second character I grind is Baron by having her take kills with Emblem Lucina's Parthia, which doubles gain XP. They are roughly a kajillion enemies on this map, and by using Parthia exclusively to take kills, she can get twice as much XP as normally possible. I exhaustively grind away at all of the enemies in this fashion to maximize my XP gains. Eventually, literally every enemy on this map comes at me, but they are all also stuck thanks to the one tile choke point. I lure out Malvir and kill him, so I can continue the grind. Around 2 hours in, I have killed nearly all of the enemies, but I misplaced one of my units, and allowing Marty to use the Hurricane Axe to smash Louie out of the one tower choke point, allowing multiple enemies to move in and attack. Marin dodges multiple inaccurate attacks and kills each of the enemies as they come in, even getting a lucky critical in the process. But unfortunately, this exposes her to further attacks and she is killed by a 22% hit, wasting all of the precious experience that I put into her this chapter. After this tragic loss, I press on with Grinding Clan with the Reflex Staff for another hour until Clan has obtained a total of 6,000 SP while still being an unpromoted axe fighter, and he still isn't that good. To finish off that map, I have Alir use the Ice Dragon Vein to block Marty while I clear up the remaining enemies and get the Draco Shield. Finally, I defeat Marty to complete the chapter. In the closing cutscene, we find out that Sombron is now straight up eating every illusion he can because he is very hungry. In Chapter 20 of this Maddie Engage Iron Man, Zephyr roasts Malvir and Marty for losing two emblem
some rings, and the screen fades to black because the dialogue engine was not made for flashy animation. We make it to Illusia Castle, which is devoid of people because Sombra was very hungry. But we do see Gris, who is ready to jump scare us, but since I will defeat him before he can do that, I will substitute in jump scares of my own. Jump scare. I promote Clan into a warrior and spend 5000 SP to give him Lunar Brace and Holdout, transforming him from a mediocre unit into an amazing one. The map begins and it is a fog of war map where Gris will hide in the darkness and harass you with Ragnarok Warp, which allows him to attack and teleport away immediately. But since I'm not keen on being surprised, I have Yunaka use a Makaya boosted and Loom Staff to immediately identify Gris's location in the lower right. Jump scare. Much like assaulting an unsuspecting haunted house worker for street cred, Clan brutally attacks Gris with a killer axe, instantly defeating him and proving that he is very strong. Jump scare. I decide to forego getting the treasure and just let the thieves run away, and I pivot over to the left corner to await the remaining enemies. I stall them with Fire Dragon Invades so I can take them out without being overwhelmed, and once the map is clear, I approach Gris and defeat him to end the map. As the chapter ends, Gris laughs maniacally upon finding out that Alir is in fact a fell dragon and Sarbron's child, because it's fucking obvious. Alir has a crisis of identity because of her newly discovered heritage, but Sigurd comforts her by asking her to purchase his video game. The remake of Fire Emblem, Genealogy of the Holy War, coming soon to Nintendo Switch. And also that Alir's multicolored hair is a sign that Lumera's unethical biological experiments have borne fruit and that Alir is in fact part divine dragon. In chapter 21 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Sauron has fled to Lethos to raise Gradlon from the sea because that matters for some reason. And Malvir brings us there to see Vale because he feels bad for her tragic backstory because he also had a tragic backstory. Marty hears of this and has a change of heart because she feels bad for Vale's tragic backstory because of her tragic backstory. We show up and find that Vale has been appropriately mind controlled by the Kaga helmet and has a new evil costume to match. Stirred by her tragic backstory, Marty tries to free Vale by breaking the helmet, but fails. For her betrayal, she is stabbed by Zephia, causing her to die and be dead, resulting in her death because she has died and she dies. Malvir is enraged by this and joins us, but he's kind of a shit unit in his base class. This map is a brutal gauntlet where you face multiple waves of reinforcements from every direction. To replace Merun, I field Kagetsu as a wolf knight so I can make use of my forged daggers. I begin by breaking the corrupted worm on the left with a fracture staff and then take it down with a fram and ivy. I use fire dragon veins to disrupt enemy formations to take them out piece by piece and I camp my units around the emblem energy pools to the left, taking out enemy spawns as they come and deflecting reinforcements from the right until they are exhausted. Next, Gris approaches and I hit him with a silent staff to trivialize him and take him down. Then Zephyr becomes aggressive and I defeat her too. I clear all the remaining reinforcements and then prepare to approach Vale. On this map, Vale stays stationary with defensive terrain with the whole retinue of enemies and she can use Low Star Rush which is liable to one shot most people on your team. So I line up outside her range and then move in all at once. I hit Vale with a dreadful aura freeze and simultaneously kill every other enemy there. By doing this I trigger the final phase of the map which causes around 10 million reinforcements to spawn. But I've already got it in the bag. I have my entire team there and so on the next turn I just jump Vale with all my units taking out all of our health bars fairly easily. As the map ends, Vale's mind control lapses and we recover all 12 emblem rings. Sabron shows up and tells Vale that as a child she is laserable and shoots a laser beam at Vale. Elia tries to use dual guard to block the laser but since this isn't Fire Emblem Fates, she is immediately killed. The end, thanks for watching. In chapter 22 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, Sabron seizes all 12 emblem rings, 10 of which he can wear on his fingers which leaves the question of the other two. On an unrelated note, did you know that snakes have two penis? Sabron uses the rings to achieve infinite power which apparently amounts to becoming very large and flies away into a portal in the sky to invade other worlds where he is likely to be killed by some gacha addicted fire emblem hero whales tricked out ether raids team. Meanwhile, Alir is still dead and to hammer in the point that she is dead, her dragonstone breaks to confirm that she is indeed dead. Evil Vale takes over because Vale didn't think to take off the goddamn mind control helmet that was on her head and all seems lost. We enter a flashback back to when Alir committed patricide a thousand years ago but because Sombron had the Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 last stand perk, he manages to shoot Alir in his dying moments, killing her because you can get a guaranteed crit if your attack has good comedic timing. As Alir lay dying for the first time in the past, she wishes that she was a good dragon as opposed to a bad dragon. <laughs>
<laughs> we then cut to a scene where Alir and Veil are both apparently dead and in some kind of afterlife, where Alir convinces Veil to edit the game's memory to reset her death flag on her character data. Veil then wakes up, breaking the helmet and using her magic to resurrect Alir as a corrupted. We then fight to reclaim the emblem rings and the map begins. This is a route map where you are stripped of all your emblem rings and must reclaim them. Veil joins this chapter and is quite good. I began by moving all my units to the left, clearing out the corrupted and the reinforcements and claiming the first few batches of rings, and then push towards the bottom of the map where there are infinite reinforcements. Eventually, I'm able to clear all the enemies and reclaim all the rings, but in the last few moments of the map, I accidentally have a wounded Kagetsu attack an enemy mage knight that immediately counterattacks and kills him, making him the third dagger unit I've accidentally gotten killed due to a misclick. As the map ends, Alir has apparently used too much energy to reignite the emblems and she dies again. The end, thanks for watching. But then, the 12 emblems show up in a cutscene to transform Alir into an emblem, making her the 13th emblem the fire emblem something that has been heavily foreshadowed both with her emblem ring appearing briefly in chapter 2 and also by the fact that Alir throughout the entire game has been able to open chests without a chest key since the final few maps of fire emblem engage are quite challenging i decided to do a whole bunch of paralogue chapters first i begin with erica's paralogue which is based on the final map of sacred stones now that i have veil on my team i can now use an extremely powerful emblem combination soren with veil soren's engage skill flare allows you to ignore 20% of resistance and heal half the damage dealt while using tomes, but it has a special synergy with dragon units. It doubles their base crit rate. This is about as crazy as it sounds. If you use a tome with a high crit rate, such as a Corrin Engraved L Surge or Obscurite, you can very easily achieve a 100% critical chance. If you combine this with Holdout and Vantage, skills that you can obtain with Veil's base 2500 SP, you can create a nigh invincible Nosferatu tank that one-shots everything with criticals as long as you are engaged. I use this extremely powerful combination to sweep the map and defeat Erica, maxing her bond level and allowing me to get Lunar Brace Plus. In the Sigurd paralogue of the Smaddy Engaged Iron Man, there are multiple optional challenges I attempt just so I can flex. This map is based on something from FE4, but I don't know exactly what because I didn't play that game and I don't care enough to look it up. The first optional challenge are two powerful sages with capped stats and multiple health bars who each give the amazing reward of 1000 gold each. The Sirens Allure its minimal gold reward is simply too tempting to ignore, so I decided to put everything on the line for pocket change. But as it turns out, even cap sages don't have that much defense, and you can just kill them. I have literally risk a 2% critical to kill Storbrand Ishtar, and it just works. I then face Great Value Julius and repeatedly attack him with Clan, and then Veil, and finish him off with Fram. The second challenge happens upon seizing the castle, which triggers a second phase of the map where Sigurd shows up with like 50 of his friends. And normally the strategy is to lure Sigurd out by abusing his longer movement range, but I decide to get all of the XP, which is absolutely not worth it. So I just sent in Veil to kill every last one of them. After killing all of his friends, which is canon compliant, I lure in Sigurd and kill him with an engage blast, completing his paralogue, maxing out his bond level, and getting nothing of material worth. In the Marth paralogue of his maddening engaged Iron Man, there are fantastic rewards such as a speed tonic. This map is based off chapter 17 of Shadow Dragon and chapter 16 of New Mystery of the Emblem, which uses the same map but with different enemy placements and reinforcement patterns. Curiously, this map draws on elements from both iterations of this map. I start by having Lily kill a thief in the lower left for a secret book, but I ignore the rest of the treasure since it's garbage. I move slightly to the upper left to fight the first group of enemies, and then slide back to take care of reinforcers from the south, using fire dragon veins to delay the upper group. There's an enemy warrior in the chamber to the right that can walk over and open a door to trigger a second phase of the map and additional reinforcements. So I use a Divine Pulse Plus Enhanced in Trap Staff to kidnap and kill him so I can farm the rest of the map for XP. I clean up everything outside and then set up to kill Marth once I open the door. All of the enemies line up and I get a massive override with Louis, killing many of them and then I push in, slaughtering everyone else and freezing Marth with a dreadful aura. On the next turn, I just gang up and kill him, ending the map, maxing out Marth's bond level and gaining a rather significant chunk of XP. XP from the level 14 promoted enemies in this chapter. In the Pactoring paralogue of this Madding Engage Iron Man, we stumble upon a ring that lets Alir marry, <clears throat> become partners with characters that are several orders of magnitude younger than them. But upon trying to claim the ring, we are ambushed by corrupted Hansen and his film crew, who asks us to take a seat right over there. This is one of the most challenging paralogue maps, which is a reference to the severity of the criminal charge. Much like a typical episode of To Catch a Predator, this map has two phases. In the first phase, corrupted Hansen will 
will attempt to run away with the evidence and the pack trick. The trick, however, is that if you defeat him immediately, the second phase will trigger and the police will spawn in from all sides of the map to arrest you. So I make sure to repeatedly freeze and immobilize the boss as I take down every other enemy first. And then all the remaining enemies spawn in. I make extensive use of Louie, who has 14 moves when engaged with Sigurd, to fight isolated groups of enemies, while I take on larger groups with my main force. After a hard-fought battle, I clear the map and defeat the boss, destroying the evidence and reclaiming the pact ring, which I use to get an S-rank support with Linden, an old man who, just like every other character in this game, is more than 900 years younger than earlier. At this point in this maddening engaged Iron Man, Wave 3 of the Expansion Pass DLC released, with new emblems and the well that gives you free SP, making all future playthroughs easier and thus invalid. In the Veronica Paralogue, we meet Veronica of her Fire Emblem Heroes, who has her Book 6 design and Book 1 personality, and she wants to conscript our self-insert in this game to fight our self-insert in the mobile game. This map is surprisingly completely new and seemingly not based on any particular map in previous games, but it is eerily similar to all those island maps in Fire Emblem Phase Revelation. It has a gimmick where you must reach two switches to activate a bridge to the boss, but you can also warp skip it pretty easily. I decided that doing either of these strategies would be too easy, so I tried to trivialize it in a more tedious way. My first plan is to repeatedly trip Veronica with bolting for one damage a hit, a process that should theoretically allow me to kill her in around 200 attacks. Unfortunately, this process is extended by the presence of two healers with healing staves, which extends the amount of hits needed to defeat Veronica to around 1000 hits, so this becomes impractical, even for me. My next plan is to try to lure the enemies out to the edge of the island and cheese them with 3 ranged tomes. I clear the rest of the map and lure out the healers, and then use Thoron, a 3 ranged tome, to defeat the healers from outside their range. Veronica, however, has 50 resistance and is all but immune to magical damage, but I come up with a solution. A leader's passive, divinely inspiring, which grants 3 additional true damage that ignores defense and resistance. So Hortensia and Ivy can benefit from Alir's personal to do 3 damage hits of Veronica, slowly chipping her HP down. And through a thorough application of this process, I finally defeat Veronica and complete the map. I would like to reiterate that, strictly speaking, none of this was necessary in any way, but stupid and tedious strategies have historically proved to be more entertaining. In the Krom paralogue of this maddening engaged Iron Man, we must defeat Emblem Krom and Robin, who occupy the same bracelet because they are roommates. This map is based on the Premonition chapter and chapter 23 of Fire Emblem Awakening, where we are completely separated from the boss by a magical barrier that can only be disabled by simultaneously destroying three crystals. There is a complicated mathematical formula that calculates the position of all your units, and if you split up your forces, Robin and Krom will trigger the second phase of the map and create water tiles all over the place and summon a million reinforcements. I was completely unaware of this, but did not trigger this trap anyway because my standard operating procedure is to move around in one gigantic death ball and defeat all the enemies on my side of the barrier and then quickly prepare to break all the crystals in one go. Because if you don't, then they will regenerate. I used Bolting to break the left crystal, I sent Louie to break the one on the right, and I just hit the one in the middle to break the barrier and trigger phase 2 of the map. And at the same time, Krom and Robin become aggressive. Krom moves in, and I open with a maximum move momentum override to deplete Krom's first health bar. I take out a second plan, and then dance to hit him with Obscurity crit. And for his fourth health bar, I use Emperor Veronica's contract to finish him off with yet another Obscurity crit. Robin then moves in, and I roll the Emblem Gacha with Veronica and summon a 5 star Rakaia who is kind of useless. So I just attack Robin with Clan, Selene, and then finish him off with the Lear to complete the map. In Chapter 23 of this maddening engaged Iron Man, we aim to destroy the fell dragon shards to stop Sombron's plans, and the remaining hounds oppose us for one last fight. This is the contractually obligatory volcano map, as decreed by ancient law, and in a normal circumstance, this is a very challenging map. Your movement is heavily restricted by terrain and volcanic bombs that fall from the sky, not to mention multiple squads of responding griffonites with freeze staves. You will have to fight your way through an overwhelming number of powerful enemies and reinforcements to reach the two bosses. Fortunately, there's a very easily accessible cheese strategy that nearly anyone can do. You can have Alcris or any other covert unit use a 20 range Astra Storm to attack and lure Zephyr and Gris, triggering their aggression and making the bosses move to you so you don't have to go to them. This drastically shortens the map and means we won't have to fight through more than half of the enemies, but it does not make the map a cakewalk. A tremendous number of enemies rush the starting area from multiple directions, 
weapons. And multiple enemy staff users will use freeze staffs to trap your units in enemy attack range and volcanic bomb range. To counter this, I send Louie, who has freeze immunity due to the secret emblem to the left. Because of the way enemy targeting works, the Griffin Knights will still target Louie with their freeze staffs even though he is immune, distracting them from my more vulnerable units. I make sure to dodge the volcanic bombs that are targeted on top of my units and slide over to the bottom right corner. I continue clearing enemies until Zephyr herself finally approaches and I immediately start attacking. I hit Zephyr for 54 damage with Louie and finish off her first health bar with Malvier, then her second health bar with Clan and her last with another Great Lance Strike. I continue fighting some more grunt enemies as Gris slowly walks towards me and once I am in range, I hit him with a Divine Pulse Plus boosted silence staff to make him incapable of counterattacking and then repeatedly one round him with Clan, Louie and Malvier to complete the map. As the map concludes, we are treated to a cutscene where Gris is just fucking dead on the ground. Zephyr, in her dying moment, decides to help us reach the next fellow dragon shard by giving us a magical crystal. And then she has the audacity to claim that making this object is what actually caused her death, as if we haven't just repeatedly struck her with lethal force just moments before. She then goes on to say, completely unprompted, that just like all the other villains, she had a tragic backstory and is a sad orphan, but we don't have time for another trauma dub and just leave. Shortly after our departure, Gris reveals that he was merely pretending to be dead to prolong his suffering, but is going to die anyway. Zephyr explains to Gris that the reason she betrayed Sombron was because she is an incel and really wanted some of that Sombrussi. Gris then reveals his tragic backstory, that he is also a sad orphan, and they both realize together that maybe the real family they wanted was the atrocity committing co-workers they met along the way. And then they both died. In chapter 24 of this Maddie engaged Iron Man, we use Zephyr's magic crystal, transporting us back in time 1,000 years and Alir encounters her past self, color-coded red for our convenience. Past Alir talks about all of the horrifying things that she and her siblings have gone through and how Sabron has used his children as disposal soldiers in his war. What kind of absolute monster would do that? Who else would have children just to send them into battle? Isn't that right, Corrin? This is a defeat boss map with a 15 turn limit and a gimmick where avalanches push you back every two turns. For my opening move, I have Louie do a maximum movement override to immediately one shot 3 sword corrupted. I then aim to reunite all my forces in the center by using a Micaiah boosted rewarp staff, but I forget to actually give the staff to Hortensia, so I am forced to walk everyone in manually. Fighting through all of the enemies on this map will be extremely difficult, so I decided to use a cheese strategy. On turn 2, I sent in Alchris to use the 20 range Astro Storm to attack past Alir and lure him into moving in. I follow up by almost getting Louis killed for no reason by making an ill advised attack, but I get bailed out by a crit. I deflect the enemies from the south with Veil as Alir moves closer and closer, and on the fourth turn, Alir has moved across half the map but is still not in attacking range, so I use a Micaiah boosted Divine Pulse Plus Enhanced Trap Staff to kidnap Alir from halfway across the map, putting him in range of my entire army. I open with a Torrential Roar to reduce his avoid, and then I start going to town. Louis wipes out his first health bar with a critical, Saline gets his second with a Leaven Sword, then I attack him with a Veronica summon which does zero damage and immediately dies, and I finish him off with Linden to complete the map in only 4 turns. As the chapter ends, we manage to destroy the fell Dragon Shard in the past which also destroys it in the future for some reason, I guess, I don't know how this works. We then cut to past Lumera finding past Alir, who has collapsed in the snow from self-inflicted wounds. Lumera shows Alir the first affection that she has ever received, this poor thing. Neglected at such a tender young age. You are my child now. I take a quick overview of my roster and find that I have 22 characters, which is in excess of the deployment limit for the remaining two chapters. As I now feel confident in my ability to complete the game, it is clearly time to try to achieve victory in a more complete and total way. But being the game with everyone but the main character dead, to advance this goal, I decide to play a skirmish map to thin the ranks. In preparation for this greater victory, I reclass Alir into a sword general and then enter a low level skirmish map with Alir and 8 other characters. While Alir can easily survive, with his high base defense as a general, everyone else isn't so lucky. I end my turn and Lapis is liquidated, Diamant is decommissioned, Vigado is flatlined, Andreo has perished, Une bites the dust, Rosado is relinquished, Sapphire is slain, and Yunak is yeeted, clearing my barracks and leaving me with exactly 14 units to use in the last two chapters. In chapter 25 of this Maddie engaged Iron Man, we encounter Lumera, Alir's dead adoptive mother who has been resurrected as a corrupted to protect the last fell dragon shard. After a short conversation, Lumera 
Mira retreats into the chamber and Veil vale follows, closing the door behind her to confront her alone. Lumera poses dramatically to reveal her tragic backstory of being a sad orphan, but as it turns out, doors can be opened by hitting them, so Alir enters and resolves to commit matricide for the greater good. This map begins with a bomb-ass soundtrack and your army split into two separate chambers. The expected way of completing this map is to crawl along the sides and reunite your forces in the center, but if you do that, you'll be quickly surrounded by reinforcements from all sides, so I decided to skip all this nonsense with warp. I begin by sending Veil vale up into the middle chamber with a warp staff, where she uses Emblem Sorin to wipe out every enemy there on enemy phase with a near 100% crit rate. I immediately follow up by using Makaya warps to put everyone into the central chamber, where I can act in safety for a short time. My opening move is to use Veronica to summon a generic stage, who gets entrapped and is immediately killed for no reason as an example to others. Above the central chamber is a massive formation of stationary enemies and multiple status staff users that is designed as a kill box to murder any unit you put in range. I could very easily pick them apart slowly by defeating these stationary units individually, but I decided to use a much less necessary but much cooler strategy, something I call the Intercontinental Luistic Missile. To prepare for this, I forge and engrave the Venomous to maximize its hit rate and reclass Louis into a Paladin to give him an S rank in Lances. I use an Entrap Staff to move the enemy Entrap user out of the way, opening a path directly towards Lumera, who has a very large amount of Void and the Anchor skill so I cannot Entrap her directly. I place Louie as far away as I can to attack Lumera for maximum range to gain a massive amount of damage from momentum. I do one initial charge with the Brave Lance to peel off both of the chain guarding martial masters protecting Lumera and then use Rescue to move Louie all the way back down, physically farther away from Lumera so he can take advantage of momentum for his next attack. I dance for Louie so he can attack Lumera again for 68 damage with the Venomous to one shot her first health bar. I cancer back and rescue Louie again, setting up a goddess dance for Louie, Seedal, and my staff user allowing me to attack Lumera again for a third time to take out her second health bar with another long distance momentum boosted one shot. I rescue Louie back down one final time, have Sido dance for him again, then warp him even farther back so he can do a massive momentum boosted lance charge for 75 damage, one shotting Lumera for the third time and completing the map in only three turns. The reward for defeating this penultimate boss is the Willy Glands which means something in German and is surprisingly not a penis joke. In the closing cutscene, Lumera lays down dying in Alir's arms, expressing how proud of her she is, before she fades away into bubbles and dies, in a fashion almost exactly like Queen Makoto from Fire Emblem Fates. In the final chapter of this maddening engaged Iron Man, after destroying all the fell dragon shards, we move the Somni into a giant portal in the sky to confront Sombron, but he takes this as his cue to tell us about his tragic backstory, that he is a sad orphan, and that he is evil because his emblem boyfriend left him, giving him severe abandonment issues, and making him swear off of making bonds or connections with anyone. Sombron proceeds to rant and rave about how he has accumulated allies merely as pawns and cared nothing for their lives, something he has been very loud and outspoken about, which makes you wonder why anyone would follow him to begin with. What kind of moron would follow a leader like that? Anyway, in case you forgot, my objective for this run is to complete the game while also killing all my allies in the process. Sombron seals the portal behind us, causing the emblems to fade away, but this also allows Alia to resummon them, specifically to have a cool Power Rangers lineup cutscene. The first phase of the map begins and it is extremely simple, containing only Sombron and a bunch of enemies on a flat plane. I begin by having Louis engaged to teleport behind Sombron and one-shot him with the Brave Lance. Nothing personnel, kid. I summon a generic and get a 3-star unpromoted level 20 mage, who is completely and utterly useless. I rescue Louis back, dance for him, and teleport behind Sombron again to one-shot him for a second time. And then Goddess Dance to have Louis teleport behind Sombron again, this time a attacking with a silver great lance, not defeating him but putting him down to 3 HP. I move up the generic mage and Alir so the mage can benefit from the 3 true damage from Alir's personal, giving him exactly enough damage to defeat Sarbron at a 32% hit rate. I attack and this generic 3 star fabrication lands the kill, defeating Sarbron's first form and completing the first phase of this map. Sarbron shifts into his fell dragon form and summons 12 dark emblems that represent previous fire emblem final bosses but they all have generic sprites and models because making those is really expensive. Sombron is quite formidable, having 100 HP for each of his 4 health bars, in addition to significant damage reduction that can only be reduced by defeating the Dark Emblems all over the map. I destroy the Dark Emblems in the lower left and right, dropping Sombron's damage reduction from 100% to 70%. This can be further reduced by defeating more Emblems, but if you deal with all 4, then he will simply summon 4 more next turn, making it easier to just attack him through his damage reduction. To help over 
overcome the boss's tremendous defense, I applied poison with my dagger units. I then attack with Veil and Gage of Sorin, who can do a reasonable amount of damage to Sombra with criticals even through 70% damage reduction. I do chip damage with Alchris and a summon to Fabrication Bow Knight and deplete the first health bar with Fram. Reinforcements start spawning in from the sides, so I need to take care of them as well. I have Clan take out some Wyverns and have Selene take out Armor Knights. I continue attacking with Veil's 100% crit L surge combo and take down his second bar with two attacks. Louis one shots flanking Wyverns with Venomous, and then I chunk off Sunbron's third health bar with Veil and finish it off with Alchrist. I then have Louis override to wipe out some Mage Knights and, and ponder my next move. At this point, I have more or less completed the map, but winning now would just be too easy. I have yet to take any casualties, which is frankly unacceptable, so it's time to start getting the ranks. I intentionally do not heal Anna, so Sombra's whirling death AoE attack annihilates her, and in the process of putting the death counter on the screen, Ivy is impaled by an armor knight, and Gold Mary is given death by a sword hero. One remaining challenge that I must absolutely watch out for is the presence of healer reinforcements from the upper left and the top of the map. If Sombra is healed, then defeating him with a leader alone will be difficult if not impossible, so I send my entire army upwards to deal with this issue. In the process of doing this, Clan is cut down by the Corrupted, Fram is finished by a Mage Knight, and Linden is laid to rest. I spend the next turn clearing enemies, and Sombra disengages all my emblems. But more importantly, Alchris ascends to the Great Bench in the Sky, and Veil is vanquished. It is now my turn, and I suicide Louis into a Mage Knight, who quickly renders him living impaired. I then have Hortensia do a Kamikaze attack against Sombra for 2 damage, and she fucking dies. I am now nearly at the finish line, both in terms of ending the game and also ending my army, but suddenly a bunch of royal knights with flame lances spawn close to Alir, putting him at risk of death. I desperately move Alir away from the royal knights, dancing him to move him farther away, and as I do this, Mavir is blasted by Sombron's howling beam and then is murdered by a mage knight, and immediately after, Saline ceases to be. Now everyone on my team is dead except for Seedal and Alir. All that remains is getting Seedal killed and getting the final blow on Sombron. But suddenly, disaster strikes. I have miscalculated and Alir is too damaged off of killing Sombron. As it turns out, I had depended on Alir being engaged to do enough damage, but Sombron's Dark Spirit skill reduced his engage meter by 1 and made him unable to engage and secure the kill. This is now a conundrum. I could have Alir attack and then dance Alir to get the kill, but that would mean leaving Sino alive, which would constitute absolute failure in my eyes. But I suddenly stumble on a solution. By engaging and transforming into Tiki, Sido is able to do exactly 2 damage to Sauron before being killed on the counterattack. And so he attacks for exactly 2 damage and then is killed on the counterattack, dying for the cause and allowing us to achieve bingo by killing every single playable native character except for our Lear. I initiate combat with Alir using the Georgios, an S rank smash sword, allowing Sauron to attack first. Alir takes 2 hits and then attacks, dealing 12 damage and stopping Sauron from killing anyone else ever again by killing him and also anyone else that he possibly could have killed. In the post-map cutscene, a defeated Sombron is sad that he will be unable to reunite with his lost emblem and also that he cannot take revenge for his entire species that was genocided 5,000 years ago, and he dies. We return to the Somnial and find out that the emblems are now disappearing, and they all line up to say their farewells, but more importantly, they line up to advertise their respective Fire Emblem games, which for the most part are now unavailable for legitimate purchase in their complete forms. Byleth tells us to buy Fire Emblem 3 Houses, which is available now on the Nintendo Switch, and also the only one that is available officially in a convenient, permanent, and complete form. Corin tells us to buy Fire Emblem Fates, but you cannot pay $20 to play the Revolution route anymore because the Nintendo 3DS eShop has completely shut down as of March 27th, 2023. Lucina tells us to buy Fire Emblem Awakening, for which the DLC is also completely unavailable for the same reasons. Makaya tells us to buy Radiant Dawn, copies of which sell for upwards of $200 on eBay, and Ike tells us to buy Path of Radiance, which can sell for $300 or more. Erica tells us to buy Sacred Stones, and Len tells us to buy Blazing Blade, the upcoming official access of which can only be obtained through the Nintendo Online Subscription Plus Expansion Pack, which is a temporary subscription service for $50 per year, meaning that you will not own the games and you will lose access to them when the service expires. Roy tells us to buy Binding Blade, which still has no official English translation and requires you to have a Japanese Nintendo account to play it on the aforementioned Nintendo Online Subscription Plus Expansion Pack. Leaf tells us to buy Fire Emblem 37776, for which we would need to time travel back to 1999 to visit a lost Japanese convenience store chain to download it onto an 
Nintendo Power Flash cartridge. Sigurd tells us to buy Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, which will hopefully be an upcoming remake that you can actually purchase like a normal human being. Celica tells us to buy Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia for the 3DS, for which a DLC is now also unavailable because of the eShop shutdown. And finally, Marth shows up, telling us to buy Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, which used to be available on the Nintendo Switch Online Store, but was then taken off in March 2021 to induce FOMO and cause artificial scarcity, and the others are untranslated or only available from third parties. After hearing all 12 sales pitches for games that have all become surprisingly difficult or impossible to actually purchase, Alina comes to the horrifying realization that she, as an emblem and the protagonist of a Fire Emblem game, is also doomed to the same fate. The End This concludes my Fire Emblem Engage Maddening Iron Man, completed without using the Divine Time Crystal a single time. The credits row and all the character endings look like they're out of a 1920s silent film as all 35 of the non alir based game characters are dead, meaning that they're all grayed out. And hilariously, the ending credits are also altered. Normally you will see around 25 CGs that collectively portray all the living characters, but since everyone is dead, I only see 6 for Alir, Veil, and the 4 main lords. And even more comically, they are all extended to being nearly a minute long each to accommodate for her lost airtime. Overall, this challenge run was quite the experience and it was really fun to do a challenge like this on a game so soon after it's released. It's good to know that my Fire Rhythm skills are not just a matter of using prior knowledge as I was able to develop a lot of my own strategies independent of other people's playthroughs. My initial impression was that this game was around as difficult as Fire Emblem Fates Conquest Lunatic, but I'd like to revise that. I think Engage is a little easier, in part due to the development of new builds and cheese strategies and also update features that make the game easier such as the mysterious well, DLC, and bonus items. The base game though is a decently balanced challenge with sufficient flexibility to make the game replayable, and the DLC adds variety though it's at the cost of making the game easier. And I'd just like to say that I think that all the people who say rewind mechanics like the Draconic Time Crystal inherently damages game design, they're incorrect. I think Fire Emblem Engage can serve as a counter example where the rewind mechanic is a separate issue from the map design and balance, seeing as I've just beaten the game without using it once. Anyway, if you like this series, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I put several months of work into each of these big series, so if you want to support future projects like this, consider joining me as a YouTube member, contributing to my Patreon, or even just showing up the next time I stream. Thanks for watching, and see you all next time.